Today, no matter where you are gathered, or how many you're gathered with, you are still His church. You are still His church. God's love hasn't changed. It is unending. It is infinite. It is deep. And believe when I say His love has power today. Power to free you, heal you, and to fill you. And restore you. God's mercy hasn't changed. He keeps no record of wrong. And His mercy is new every morning. The cross hasn't changed. It's still there for you and for me, no matter who you are or what you've done. This is what we need to be reminded of today. That wherever two or more are gathered in His name, Jesus is standing in our midst. This means the church hasn't changed. The church isn't a building. It is you and I together, the Spirit of God living in us, living through us. So today, as we come together and as we worship, let us be reminded that we are still His church. God is here with us right now. And no matter what your past looks like or how scary your future may be, you can trust God. You can trust God. And because He is here with us, we have everything we need today. We are still His church. We are still His church. We are still His church. Well, welcome back to week number three of our multi-series or multi-week sermon series of the life lessons through the book of James. Uh, please turn with me to James chapter 2. Uh, James chapter 2, where we're really spending the majority of our time together today. Um, we will be bouncing quite a bit throughout the entire Bible, um, and I know there's no way that you guys are going to turn to them fast enough, but if you do have your pens and papers ready, you can write down the scriptural text, and you can cross-reference them later on. And I do encourage each person to follow up on things, uh, and I say this every single week, don't ever just take my, my message to you, um, you know, lightly. I want you to check in and make sure the, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through me and it lines up with Scripture. Uh, so feel free to do that, you know, check in as often as we can. Um, on week number one, I think as we started out this series, um, I, I shared with you that the book of James is just jam-packed with life lessons that are easy to apply to our lives right here, right now. Uh, so we don't have to wait till five years from now to apply these life lessons. Uh, each week we can take that lesson and apply it to our life. Even today, even before you leave this church, you can start applying these life lessons. And I think today will be no different for that as we dive in. Um, I did not welcome our first time guests yet, but I would like to do that because it's awesome to see new people coming into the house of the Lord every single week. So church family, can we welcome our guests, please? Awesome. Welcome to all of you guys, including the church family that has returned. It is so neat to, uh, to watch even the directory grow. Um, so uh, just thank you for all of that. So today we are going to be focusing our attention on the subject of favoritism. Uh, the Bible has plenty to say um, about treating people fairly and without bias um, or a biased attitude or a biased heart. Um, I know you guys just kind of got comfortable, but I'm going to ask you to please stand if you could um, as we go into the Word of God. And we'll be picking up at verse 1 of James chapter 2, and follow along with me if you would. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing gold ring and a fine clothes. And a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst, uh, sorry, among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the anointing that is already here. And I ask you, God, to speak through me as your vessel. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the ears and the hearts and the minds of those that are listening. Help them to hear your voice speaking to them, Father. And I pray, Lord, that you bring healing to our lives, correction to our behavior, and our hearts to be changed like yours forever. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 
You may be seated. As I have said many, many times to you guys, it is very important for us to understand the who, what, when, where, and how Scripture is pertaining to um, in order for us to, uh, to have the full picture of what the Scripture is trying to say to us. And here, James is very clear on whom the letter is addressed. Uh, we can see by the opening line in verse 1, he's addressing the brothers and sisters. Uh, as we know throughout the Bible history, um, brothers and sisters pertaining to the church. And what's interesting about this passage here that James is writing to, uh, he is not implying that there's favoritism going on, that there's not favoritism going on in the world, but he's not addressing that issue. What he is addressing is the favoritism, the biasness that's taking place within the church walls. And the reason why he's doing that is because in 1 Peter 4, 17, what it tells us is judgment starts in the house of the Lord. There is no possible way that we as Christians can go change the world if we ourselves are broken within. So it's important for our hearts to be changed, to be more Christ-like in every single way that's possible. So this morning, as we go through this passage, understand that Jesus Christ is speaking directly to you today in order for you to change the way you think about other people, th change the way you think about yourself, and to make sure that we're playing, uh, playing not, uh, without favoritism in anything that we're talking about. So in some tr Bible translations, I don't know what you're reading here today, you may have seen the word partiality being used. And that is not a word that we use very often in the English language. Um, but there are several terms that means the exact same that, we are probably, that you probably are more familiar with. And one of those things is favoritism, discrimination, racism, and bigotry. All of these mean an unfair um, and unjust bias toward someone else. I will just come out and say right now with all these different things, it's stupid. There's no place for bigotry, division, discrimination, racism, or hatred amongst the believers. There's nowhere in those in that thing. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that James wrote this around 50 AD. So many, many years ago is when this scripture was written. And you would think that James is writing this toward the church in 2023 in the United States because there's division among them. And he wasn't only speaking to the church here. He was also speaking of the church then for one reason. It's because the heart of man has always had the sin issue of dividing, uh, of being malice, being you know, cruel to one another. So today what I would like to do is begin to tear down these di divisional lines between people. And as I go through this, um, as I went through studying, preparing for this message, I found... I don't know how many, how many I found, honestly, how many different reasons why favoritism and racism and all these different things are absolutely wrong. There's no place for them. And I, I compiled up as, as four different areas that we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you have your pen and papers ready, here's the number one reason why uh, favoritism, racism, hatred, division is, is wrong. And here it is, it is inconsistent with the word of God. That's the first and foremost reason why we can see why favoritism is wrong. Nowhere in Scripture can we find uh, God showing unjust favoritism toward one person or another, or even a people group. It doesn't matter what people group they are, God is still loving, He is still patient, He is very kind to people. Um, now, those patients can be tested, and eventually you run out of chances, but He does everybody the same thing. He tries to give people that grace and that mercy right out the gate. Romans 2, verse 11, it says this, for God does not show favoritism. Now, this is probably one of the easiest passages anyone can ever find whatsoever because it is very straightforward. It is cut and dry, and there should be no gray area when you're looking at this passage. God does not show favoritism. Well, there is no way you can misunderstand that, that Bible verse right there. And here's the thing for us to, to remember as believers in Christ, okay? As brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be pattering our lives after the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So, and we should also be patterning our lives after the example that Jesus Christ has given us throughout his own life here on earth. And if we go back through the pages of, uh, in the Bible looking at Jesus' own life and his example of love to us, nowhere do I see Jesus being unfair or unkind to any, any particular people group. 
I mean, he, he sat down with the tax collectors, the same as he did with, with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the, the people of the Lord. He sat down with everybody, treating them fairly because of, I guess, a few different reasons. Uh, and it's because he loved them all. And here's the thing, that Jesus Christ never made a distinct, distinction between people. It doesn't matter what it is. The Bible tells us the same thing. There's no distinction between one person or another. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 20, through 29, tells us very clearly that we are all on the same level uh, and the same playing field when it comes to salvation. Okay, here's what it says from verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, that means Greek or, uns, you know, and people like that, uh, neither slave nor free, nor male or and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So did, Jesus did not have favorites. God doesn't have favorites, and nor should we. We should not treat people unfairly or unkindly because there is no place for that to be found in Scripture and especially in the kingdom of God. Amen? So I guess we need to ask the question, why did Jesus do these things? Why um, did he die for everyone, including the people that were actually executing him? The, the guards that were nailing him to the cross, the guards that were pushing the crown of thorns on his head, he died for them. And I guess we need to understand why, we, why he did that. It's because he's seen value in every single person, including the ones that were doing him harm. He's seen a, a value worth dying for in those kind of men. And maybe that's what we should be looking back at on ourselves, looking at people with that same level of love that Jesus Christ did. You know, if we're going to be called followers of Christ, we should be treating people the same way as Christ does. Amen? So... We, the value that we see in people is not determined by what they bring to the table, what they can do for us. It's not by how they treated us or what they've said to us. That value is still inside of them regardless of what they're doing and how they're acting. And, and I guess the other thing we got to look at is, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, when he obeyed the Father, he did this out of love. He obeyed God the Father out of love. He laid down his life for the people of earth out of love. He remained on the cross because of love. He, he treated everyone around him equally because of love. And I guess that's really where we need to start looking at is because we cannot show favoritism because favoritism really is the opposite of love, right? And that, you can put that on, down as number two if you want to. You know, favoritism is the opposite of love. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter in our Bibles, okay? And I know we, we use that quite a bit um, when we're talking about marriage counseling or weddings or things with a relationship. We go to 1 Corinthians 13 because we think, oh, that's the love chapter of the Bible. But one of the things that I find interesting about this chapter, nowhere does it say husband and wife. It doesn't say anything about spouse. What it does say is love. And love is applied to everyone, you guys should love me. I hope you do. You know I love you guys. You should love one another. And not everybody's married together, right? But we all have that common bond of love with one another. And I want to look at this passage real quick. We'll look at verses 1 through 3 in just a moment here, 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to see how we can apply these, the, these lessons of love to our own life so we can don't show favoritism to other people. So look at verse 1 with me, okay? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels... But do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have the faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all possessions to the poor or give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So again, nowhere in that passage did it mention anything about husbands and wives. Now, should we, do, should we be doing those things for our husbands and wives? Absolutely. Trust me, it will help your life out a lot if you do these certain things. But these principles of love should be applied to all areas of our life. Uh, many, many years ago, um, I was encouraged to read uh, the book of Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Have you guys ever read that book before? Life-changing book. It's one of those books that I reflect back on a lot. I mean, I am so grateful that I was turned on to that book, and I, I, I couldn't tell you how many copies I've bought and gave out to other people. 
Um, but because I know as soon as I, as I, after I opened that book and started reading it, and then after I finished the book, I applied it to our marriage, Angie and my, my marriage, okay? I seen an instantaneous change in our communication, on our level of love, our connectivity. And I thought that was just amazing that I could apply these principles of love to my marriage. So I thought, okay, if it worked with my love with my wife, would it work with my love with my kids? I said, let's try that. So I began to do those same things. I'll use those same principles with my kids. And, I, and I, I could see a change in our relationship there. You know, I spent more quality time with them. I gave them more words of affirmation. I built them up, you know. Um, I didn't do gifts because, well, we were broke. So I just did the words thing, right? So I did all these different things. And I seen a change with my kids. And I was like, that's so crazy. So I said, what about other people? If it works with my wife, works with my kids, what about other people? So I started applying to those that are in church with me. So I began to show them love and the five love languages. I didn't know what their love language was, so I just tried to try certain things out, and I began to see a, a, just a closeness becomes forming with our own lives. So at this time, I was still running work, doing construction, so I was like, hey, it worked with church people. It has to work on a job site. And I'm going to tell you this right now. My cut guy, his love language was not physical touch. I know, I'm as shocked as you were. He did not like hugs. When I talked to him with my hand on his shoulder, just talking about the morning, he didn't like that. So his love language was something different, but it's okay. I didn't give up. I just kept on hugging him. So uh, he don't talk to me anymore for some reason, but that's okay. Um, Creepy J is what they called me at, church, at work after that. So um, <laughs> anyway, don't give up. But these, these areas of, that we can show love to other people, it's limitless. Because here's the thing that I found. Even those guys on my job site, and I was kidding, I didn't hug nobody. I tried, they didn't like it. Um, they needed that love. They needed to know that they were cared for. And I know rough and grumble, you know, construction guys, there's no way. No, they are. They're still human beings. The same as those human beings that are walking into the church on a Sunday morning they're extremely broken. They're fragile. They are wounded sometimes from past experiences with past churches. So they come in with this apprehension going, am I going to be treated the same way as I was last time? Is this going to be the same routine as I, as that I have already experienced? And what's great about it, I know this body does as well. And this, is, this message is not a beat you over the head. This is an encouragement to keep going forward and being strong about it. That level of love and, and care and, and friendliness and unbiasedness, that is what's winning people to the Lord. That's what's doing it. Because here's the thing, okay, so we keep going through 1 Corinthians 13 through and 4 through 7. We see how we can show that love to other people. Now, we're not just talking about spouses. This is showing love to other people who are walking into our lives. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not, it does, I'm sorry, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And we see, as we go through that list right now, we can see Jesus' life being portrayed in every single category. He did every single one of those things perfectly. And as Christ followers, like we said earlier, we should be doing our very best to be portraying that same level of love to every single person that's walking in, into our life. Whether that just be passing in the grocery store, coming into the church service, maybe it's a family member that you can't get along with so well. Showing that level of love is so important for each person. You know, and if we take that, 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 that list and flip it around and look at someone who is being unkind, you know, greedy, unforgiving. What does it say about the person and their behavior? It tells me that they're being unloving. And we should be the most loving, compassionate people. And here's one of the reasons why we should be the most loving, compassionate people, because God loved us in spite of our past. We should also love others in spite of their past, loving them exactly where they're at. And this is not saying we're going to condone sin and say, hey, you just keep on living that certain way. But we're going to love them exactly where they're at because that's what Christ did with us. Not one time, I can't, I don't, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, 
But not one person ever had to clean up their act before coming to the cross. Not one person. Jesus says, come on in. Don't worry about the mess. I'll clean that up later. Right now, I just want you to be a whole family together. I will love on you. I will support you. I will take care of you. So just come in. Yep, that's a mess. We'll, we'll take care of that. And so many times people think they have to clean up their mess before even coming to church. And that's not the case. And here's, here's the problem, because there's some churches that may tell them that. They may act that way. And not here. We must maintain that level of love for those that are coming through these doors. No matter what they're facing, no matter what they're going through, we must never show anything except for that genuine love of Christ for each person. You know, number three here, if you're keeping notes, discrimination, partiality, racism, and bigotry all come from a false sense of superiority. Many times people treat others poorly because they have the wrong motives in their own heart. Um, it may come in a form of some kind of superiority complex, thinking they are better than someone else. One of the things that I love about the cross, it is even playing field for every single person. Whether you're the first day that you've been with Christ, if you've been with Christ 30, 40, 50 years, or you've never knelt at the, at the altar to submit your life to Christ, he still loves you the same. I want you to understand that today. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. That love is there for you. And that's the same thing as we should be extending to every single person. Not asking what do they bring to the table? What can I gain from them? And I guess that's part of what we're looking at today is looking at why we treat people unfairly or unkindly or with favoritism, especially when we think there's something for us to gain from it. If you go back to James chapter 2 for just a second, and we'll look at verse 5 through 7. And it's just kind of interesting that this is the way James describes it to us, okay? And I'm going to explain it here in just a moment. Listen, dear brothers and sisters, has, God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the, in the sight of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom of, of the promise of those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is, not the, uh, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Uh, are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who, who, uh, among you, who you belong? So one of the things that I pulled out of that when I was looking at this is we buddy up, we, we kind of uh, schmooze along with like rich and powerful people because we think somehow that clout was going to rub off on us. And that's so wrong for us to even think about trying to do it that way because you know what? It's not about what we can get from somebody else. And if we're trying to gain something from being close to someone else or treating someone else in a certain way, we're in the wrong, okay? I don't look at you guys like, okay, what can I get out of that person or that person or whatever? Now, I do look at like, what do they offer to the kingdom of God so I can pull your spiritual gifts out? But it's not for my personal gain. And too often, that's what we try to do. We exploit other people's uh, abilities, talents, money, whatever it is, and their prestige to rub off on ourselves. And we cannot do that because it's not about what other people can bring to the table. Another story that I remember was uh, Pastor Kelly shared this one with me. Um, this took place several years before I even met Pastor Kelly. They were actually at the other church at this time. And he said that um, one Sunday morning, an older guy, kind of you know, scruffy looking, comes into church, doesn't look like he had a whole lot of money or whatever. Um, he came in, sat in the church, really didn't bother with nobody, just kind of did his own thing. And, you know, obviously the church was loving. I mean, our church and, and Patrick Kelly's church, uh, C3, you guys would not know who went to where because you guys all have the same heart of unity and love, okay? So that, that level of love and unity was going on in the church even then. So they embraced the guy, they encouraged the guy, whatever, you know. And there was a couple people that did not get to say hello to this new gentleman. So he left the church after the church service was over with, and a couple people ran out the church doors to say goodbye to him. He vanished. He said, like, he, didn't, he wasn't there. And they looked, and they, they were on the street, you know, because it was like a, a, a right on the street where the parking was. They looked north, south, east, west. There was nobody to be seen. He's like, there's no way this guy outran us. There's no way that he got into a vehicle, because it was instantly. He truly believes that he was an encounter with an angel of the Lord that day, just coming in to see what the church was all about, giving an update to the Father, you know. And so he takes that lesson and applies it to our life to make sure that we're not treating people unfairly because you have no idea who's standing next to you. You have no idea. Hebrews 13, 2, it tells us, do not forget, do not forget to show uh, hospitality to strangers, 
For by doing so, some people have, have shown uh, hospitality to angels without knowing it. I know my wife, she had an encounter with a guy at Walmart. I know, angels go to Walmart, okay? It's, it's crazy, but it happens. But she knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was an angel of the Lord. Because after she actually spoke to him, she said she could see his eyes just glowing like, like a, a glass, you know, like looking to this, uh, uh, like a glass ocean almost. It was, just, it was just the deepest blue you can think of. And she knew that it was not anyone except for an angel. And what I'm saying to, about, saying, saying to you this morning about is this, we need to be showing that, that love and the compassion to everyone because you really don't know who that person is. Are they an angel? Maybe, maybe not. But you also don't know what they're coming out of. Maybe that kind word, maybe that smile, maybe holding that door open for somebody, just encouraging them, whatever it is, that one little gesture of love saying, you know what, you have value. I love you exactly where you're at. That can change an entire life. I know I'm kind of full of stories this morning, but here's another one I've seen. This was on Facebook. It's about a little boy who felt that she, he should go talk to her, his neighbor. So the neighbor, I and mean, this is a little bitty guy. It was pouring down rain. He says, Dad, let me go talk to the neighbor guy. And they did not do that. The dad's like, I'm not going over there. It's pouring down rain. So the kid left on his own, knocked on the neighbor's door, and says, hey, I just want to just hang out with you and say I love you. That was the day that, the, that that man was going to commit suicide. He had it all planned out. But that little boy's action changed his life. So here's the question I have for the church. How many times do we act a certain way and change the course of history because of our love, because of our commitment to other people? You know, and we have to make sure that we're doing things for the Lord. When the Lord tells you to do something, go do it. Go do it right there. Maybe you have to go to the lake and you know, rescue a baby. I don't know what's going to happen. But it happens. You don't know what the Lord's going to put upon your heart. And whatever it is, do so in obedience. Because here's the other thing about uh, favoritism, okay? This is point number four. Favoritism is absolutely sinful. It's a sinful behavior to have for racism, bigotry, um, all these different things. It's sinful. I want you to hear that very clearly. It's sinful. It's not just bad. It's not just, just you know, uh, you know uh, uncomfortable. It's sinful through and through. I want to go back to James 2, verses 8 through 10 for just a second. I want you to read this with me, okay? It is super, super important for us to remember and understand where we're at with our heart and what God looks at with our behavior. It says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But, mm, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Verse 10, watch this now. For everyone keeps the whole law and yet stumbles, I'm sorry, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles uh, at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Now this is a little tough passage for us to swallow, but it has such an important lesson for us nonetheless. You know, I believe that each person in this room right now is striving to do their very best. I believe that full heartedly. And I want to encourage you to continue doing so. And if you're finding some areas of your life that you are struggling to show love and, and, and care or even you know, favor, and not showing favoritism towards somebody, I want you to examine your heart today. Ask the Lord, why are you behaving a certain way? Now, if someone hurts you and you're acting a certain way, that still doesn't give you justification. It doesn't. God wants to bring healing in those areas as well. And I mean, this is one of the things that you will learn in ministry right out the gate, that people are hard to work with sometimes, okay? I know Pastor Kelly told me right away after I got into the ministry, he goes, ministry is easy except for people. You know, people's what makes it hard. And it's true because people are sometimes, they come at things with different angles and different motives. But we have to remember why we're doing the things we're doing. Why are we gathering? Why are we calling ourselves Christ followers? Is it just to get into heaven? Because if it is, you're really missing the main point. We are here to show others you know, uh, care and love and embrace them right where they're at. So this is one of the things that I do want to say is I want to applaud each of you guys. I do. I mean, I watch you guys on, on, on Sunday morning and, and the, everywhere. Sometimes you guys don't leave for hours, which is awesome, you know, because you guys love each other. As this church continues to grow, and I know that it's going to continue to grow, God showed that to me very clearly, we have to do our very best just to love every single person coming through these doors, regardless of where they're at. It doesn't matter what, where they're at, how they dress, what color or wherever their hair is at. It doesn't matter about those things. It's about the heart. Each person, 
was worth dying for according to Christ. That means each person's worth living or loving right where they're at. Because how awesome would that be to have a house full of people who were once broken and now healed? And here's the other thing that we're doing. We're teaching. We're teaching those that are coming in, this is a safe place to be. They may be coming in with those things, that hesitation in their heart going, is this going to be the same as it was down the street? Is this going to be the same as it was when I was a child? No, it's not. This is called the house of the Lord. We're going to be like, like Christ in every way we possibly can. And what we're doing is we're teaching them how to also pattern after Christ. We love them. They love the next group. And we continue going down this, this cycle. And this is what we're talking about. We're, being called, we're called to be disciples of Christ, right? Christ's followers. Whatever Christ did, we use that as a pattern to pattern our own lives and to show love. One of the other things, the last things I want to share with you is when we give, when we love people exactly where they're at, we have to give the Holy Spirit space to work, okay? Not everybody's going to lay down their problems on day one. I wish it was that easy. I truly do. But some people struggle with things years and years after they come to Christ. And that's just a cleanup process through the Lord. The Lord's cleaning up the mess. Their heart is saved. Their, their soul is, is secure in, with the Lord. But there's still some aches and pains to work through. Allow the Holy Spirit space to work in their lives. Encourage them whenever you feel led to encourage them. And just be their friend. Be their brother and sister in the Lord. Amen. Never show favoritism. Always strive for unity and operate in love no matter what. Amen? Let's pray. Hey, I want to thank you for watching with us today. I hope you were blessed and encouraged by this video. I want to invite you to worship with us next Sunday. To make it easier to find us and stay up to date with all of the other videos, I want you to hit the subscribe button at the bottom of this page. This way you never miss another thing. If you want to reach out to me, you can go to our website and scroll all the way to the bottom of the homepage. That website is www.vccphillips.com. You'll see a space to send me a message at the bottom of that page. Thanks again for watching and remember, God loves you. See you next Sunday.